was like Matchbox 20, he kind of liked it. And I looked over to like some drunken frat boys at the time and I was like, well, let me ask you guys a question. Would you go see a band called Matchbox 20? And they went, Matchbox 20! And I thought, I thought it sounded so cool when they yelled it. Hello, my friends, and welcome to The Paula Ferris Show. Whether you're watching on YouTube, maybe you're listening on your favorite app or platform, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. These are going to be candid conversations to help you live your best life because life happens, so let's talk about it. This season, we are going to be digging into my big break, the big break of my guests. And episode one, kicking things off with Rob Thomas from Matchbox 20. I've been a huge fan of Matchbox and Rob since... I was in college and I had the chance to interview he and his wife about 10 years ago when I was still at ABC News. But Rob talks about Matchbox 20 being on the chopping block and the song that saved them. He talks about the random jobs like construction, driving delivery trucks, waiting tables, all while he was waiting for his big break and advice to any of you who are looking for that big break as well. He also talks about his best and his worst parenting advice. Without further ado, here's Rob. Addie, I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Rob Thomas. You look at you. Isn't she so cute? Rob, I know you oh love dogs. Gosh, you I your, do. You got your little dog. Uh, uh, my little guy is asleep right there. <laughs> he's asleep. He just got back in the vet. He's all mad. He's boy. And this is a fan made this pillow here of uh, of my Sammy that passed away. But look yes. at that little angel he is. Oh, I know. When I first saw that, I was like, "Is that your a dog or your pillow?" So, yeah, I know. They- got, just behind this couch, yeah, I have like an entire studio's worth of art that fans have made Aww. of of my of of my dogs Aww, from every baby. possible medium. That's amazing. I know you're a big animal lover, both you and Maddie are. This is so Addie is a cavapoo. She's cavalier and poodle because I know people are going to ask about her. Well, Rob, I can tell exactly where you are. You're in your basement where you write a lot of your songs. You probably got right. Yeah, down my to your left or right down your studio because I've been there before. That's right. Um, and I've explained to people that um, I had an opportunity to interview you for ABC and Nightline. I don't know, was that like six years ago? And got a chance to talk to you and your beautiful wife, Muddy. And- and you played some music for us. So it was, it's, it's great to connect with you again. So, yeah. It's good to see you again. Yeah. So tell me like, uh, what have you been up to? You just came, matchbox 20 just went back on tour. Uh, you guys are back out there. You produce some new music. You got a new album you're working on. Yeah. So we, um, you know, we weren't going to make a new record. We kind of thought that maybe that phase was over and we were just going to tour a lot. And then every now and then put out a new, uh, a song maybe yeah. when we tour. Um, and I was working on a solo record, but then, when we canceled, like for the third year, well, postponed for the third yeah. year, we felt like, you know, we, we had already set ourselves up that we wanted to be working that summer. We were already doing something. And we felt like now for fans to come back out the following year, we should have some new music. And so we started with the, you know, a couple more songs. And then that turned into a whole album. Wow. And then uh, we, you know, we toured from, I think, May until maybe like two weeks ago. Wow. And, uh, it was it was the longest tour that we've had, but one of the most successful too. So it was it was nice, you know, that to go back out and see all those people were still there. Yeah, you're one of those guys. I mean, you really engage with just about everybody. Like after a show, you are hanging around, not just talking to the guys and gals backstage, but like you're interacting with your fans. But I can imagine like getting back on the road after all this time. It was nice, but probably a little exhausting. You know it. It was beautiful. I mean, I think, you know, we've been very fortunate to do it at this level, which means, you know, it's it, we travel pretty comfortably. Yes. You know, we're not in the van and trailer anymore. <laughs> um, everybody, everybody like has their own bus and everybody's, you know, and it, it's and we we get along better than we've ever gotten along. So that made the tour way more pleasant. Yep. You know, it's just a bunch of people just having a really nice time and kind of appreciating why we're there. And a lot less drama, a lot less, you know, everything wasn't so high stakes all the yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, you guys have been together like a couple of decades. So like- the, and It's been almost 30 years now. That's, cr- okay, now I feel old, okay? So- You okay, feel old. I, well, we're almost the same age. I think we're like three, two, three years apart. So, and yes, I'm not going to say who's younger, who's older. Um, but Rob, I, look, take me back to the childhood. So I, I, like, how did music begin for you? You grew up in Florida. You've talked about you had a pretty, pretty rough childhood. Um, music kind of became an escape for you. How did you, why did you get into music to begin with? I mean, it's really weird because I, like there was nobody in my family. I mean, in, I think at every turn, anyone who was in my family, probably, I mean, out of an abundance of like, I think it was well-meaning 
discouraged me from, you know, going down this road because, you know, everyone wants to tell you how impossible it is to try and make it. But like, because of, you know, the situations that I had found myself in at an early age, I didn't have a lot of other options. Yes. And for some reason, I met a group of people that, that were playing music and, and it just kind of spoke to me, not, not just the, the idea of playing music, but this community that they kind of created amongst themselves and this family, maybe, you know, they were kind of looking after each other in these ways that I had been lacking in certain mm-hmm. parts of my life. I found this other group where I kind of belonged. Um, and I wasn't even writing at first. I was just singing other people's songs, some covers and, and some stuff that like one of the guys in the band was writing. But I, I bet like, as soon as I started, I knew yeah. That, that was kind of, this was the only thing I really wanted to do. What came first? Like playing? Because I know you play the piano. You play a lot of, you play a lot of instruments too, or singing. Like, so which one came first? I started singing, you know, I started to learn how to play the piano because my, my mom would let the band rehearse at my house. And so I would always have the equipment there. Oh, I'm sure. So like, I'm just trying to imagine my kids bringing home a bunch of like, artists and uh, guitar players and musicians and how loud it would be here. Yeah, I mean, we were that house, you know, like after it's, it's almost like in the movie, you know, like we were that house where the, you know, after school, the garage doors open and the band is just playing like a full garage band, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and it was really funny because like I said, my mom was not the most supportive, but there was an odd twist where, yeah. where she let us take over, not only take over, but like we took half of the garage and we like, we, you know, soundproofed half of it. We had like a full, you know, working rehearsal space in there that she let us have. So she wasn't always trying to block yeah. me off at every time. So piano, self, were you self-taught? Yeah. I, you know, I started off, I would start learning, I would buy chord books, you know, and start learning chords. And then I would take song books of songs that I knew and learn those songs with all the chords and then find songs with new chords until I knew all those chords. And then I, uh, you know, the guy in my band was going to Berkeley College of Music at the time where my son just graduated from. Yeah. And he would have these music theory books. And so I would take some of his old music theory books and kind of read about notes and how they were relative to each other yeah. and, and were about, you know, sight reading, even though I'm really bad at it. Yeah. So, okay. So the first band was called, is it Tabitha's Secret? Is that right? Well, the first band, was, like we had a few really bad cover bands. Like we were Fair Warning for a while. Oh my God. Uh, we were Bondage what? for a while. Um, and then... I took like, that was when I was in like high school. And so then I took a few years where I wasn't really doing much, but I started writing more and like really getting into the writing side of things. And that's when I started to put, um, I wanted to put my own band together because I had these songs that I was writing that I wanted, you know, a band to play. And that was where like the big shift started from like me just doing cover songs to, you know, me really focusing on writing. And so me and Brian and Paul, who were in Matchbox 20, where we were also in Tab of the Secret with two other guitar players. And that was like where things started to yeah. get serious. Tab of the Secret. Give me the backstory behind that name. It was honestly, there was some news article about a missing girl that had been found. It was kind of like one of those Jessica in the well kind of stories. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and her name was Tabitha. And so it was something that, that, that one of the other guitar players had come up with. I think between Tab of the Secret and Matchbox 20, we have a knack for bad band names. Uh, well, nothing's worse than bondage, though. I mean... <laughs> I, know. I know. We really... I, and there, you know, like, you see a bunch of these, like, kind of geeky kids wearing Cavaritis with earrings. We, yeah. we weren't living up to the name. Oh, that's hilarious. So Matchbox 20 formed in 1995. Yeah. Uh, I was in college at the time. And where did you get that name? Where did you get Matchbox 20? How'd you go from Tab of the Secret to Matchbox? So we were, we had a record deal before we had a name. Yeah. Okay. Like, so I got signed originally and the band Tab of the Secret had broken up. So they signed me, but I wasn't comfortable kind of taking all that on on my own. So I brought Paul and Brian as well to sign. Yeah. So the three of us signed this record deal. We were still looking for guitar players and we needed a name. Um, and we went through 4,000 of them. I mean, over and over and over, just list after list after list. And one day Paul was, uh, he was a waiter at this place that we used to play at and the story he tells was that he saw a guy with a jersey that had 20 on it and like a bunch of patches and one patch was Matchbox and he was like Matchbox 20. He kind of liked it. And I looked over to like some drunken frat boys at the time and I was like, well, let me ask you guys a question. Would you go see a band called Matchbox 20? And they went, Matchbox 20! And I thought, I thought it sounded so cool when they yelled it. I, was like, I didn't want to hear it. You know? And at the time, like you'll understand this, like it... it we, we were, you know, being big MTV heads. Oh, yeah. And, uh, it had to pass the Kurt Loader test, 
Which meant, like, could we imagine Kurt Loder coming on with MTV News and being like, you know, uh, Matchbox 20 released a new album today. Uh-huh. And we're like, yeah, it feels good. I like it. It, it does. It's got, I mean, yeah. I always wondered, like, the origin of it. What was the – and it's somebody's T-shirt, just how random yeah, it is. Yeah, it's really it's- funny. I mean, there was no – you know, there was no deep meaning behind it. And I, I think, you know, now we're kind of with it, just like I'm Rob, yeah. you know. That's just the way it works now. And now we're Matchbox 20. That's just who we are, whether we like it or not. It's worked. It's worked for a very long time, like you said, going on 30 years. So, Rob, when you look back at it, like, what was your big break in music to get to where you are? Or were there a multitude of them? What was your... What, what I mean, there was a couple of things. Like, you know, we came up in what we call the last good time, right? Which it was yeah. kind of the last group of musicians who still came about their success in a way that kind of started back in the 50s, mm-hmm. right? You, you got a band together, you made some songs, a guy from a label would come check you out. And if he liked you, you'd make a record and that song, the, you get songs on the radio. And if you get enough songs on the radio, people come see you. You know, it was like- You played it in pretty, your mother's garage. I mean, that- Yeah, very old. Like everything about it was a very, like the last kind of group of, of old school before everything kind of changed, yeah. you know, exponentially faster year after year. So we were lucky enough, A, that there was a guy named Kim Stevens who was from Atlantic Records who once came to like a local music festival to see another band called Spider Monkey and (laughs) caught us while we were there. And yeah, don't laugh. Spider Monkey was the big band. I know, just the name. And they, uh, and he was like, you know, you guys don't have it yet, but he kept coming back every few months. Whenever we'd have a show, he would just appear sometimes and keep checking us out until he kind of felt like we were getting somewhere. And then when we broke up, that he was the guy that said, listen, I think you've got good songs. I think I, you know, I can trust your songwriting. Right at that time, this guy named Matt Serletic, who had just produced uh, these two collective soul records that had done really well at the time on Atlantic Records, came through and found us. And we wound up signing a production deal through him to Atlantic. We made this record. Then the day that our record came out, our record label folded. We were on Lava Records. Uh, it was an imprint on Atlantic. And everybody pretty much except for like four bands on Lava got axed. And then the four of us folded into Atlantic. But we were kind of on the cutting block at that time because, right. you know, we didn't, we didn't have any proven success. Our record came out that day. That first week, we sold a whopping 612 copies oh of the record. Gosh. Um, and at the time we thought that was great. Like we hadn't sold 600 copies of our record ever, but we didn't realize that that was a, a disappointment. And then <laughs> like, we put out a song called long day. It, we made a big video. It was on MTV, but it wasn't responding. Like it was just tanking. And so we were just about to be let go. And there was a program director because this was a time when like, if you were a program director of a radio station, you could just play songs you liked. Yep. You know, like you were kind of dictating what was going to be on your station as opposed to now where there's like a computer algorithm that kind of tells you what you're supposed to be playing and, and all these companies own, you know, like one company owns like 1700 stations or something. So Dave Rossi liked the song push. Mm -hmm. And so on his radio station in Birmingham, Alabama, he put it into heavy rotation immediately. And every night we were playing little clubs to nobody. And then we pulled into Birmingham that night at this place called five points music hall. And there was a line around the block. And, and then Atlantic said, you know, there's something happening here with Push. They released Push and it started immediately to respond. And then everything kind of went from that point on there. So it was like this, it was a convergence of a bunch of happenstances, right? That had to happen yep. in succession. And even sometimes like the things that happened that we thought were like big blows to us and setbacks turned out to be, you know, put a lot of wind in the sail. Yeah. If we had been on Lava, maybe it wouldn't have been as good as being on Atlantic Records. You know, yep. if, if, you know, our first band... We, when that band broke up, there was a lot of contention. There's a lot of litigious uh, stuff that was going on. And so to save myself from further problems, instead of, you know, all the songs that I had written my whole life leading up to that moment, I took six months before the first Matchbox record and wrote an entire record. Everything except for 3AM was brand new. So that was like my sophomore record, Mm. but it was such a better record than what I'd done before. So that setback also turned out to be something good. So along the way, it was all these things that happened and I didn't realize that they were all, you know, like paving the way for me to have more success. That's incredible. My friend often says that a setback is often a setup, right? Yeah, a lot of times. When you, and it's hard to see those things in the moment. It is. You it's know, because, tough. and I think it's, it's, it's the, the problem with planning. 
You know, like everybody has a plan. Everybody uh-huh. has a way that they uh-huh. think things should go. And they and it, and it involves step one, two, three, four. And step three doesn't go the way you thought. It's just like, oh, mm-hmm. it's all over now, you know? Yeah. And you don't realize like, it's not your plan. No. No. You know, like you're just hold on and just go for the ride and see where it takes you. That's awesome. I love the convergence. It was a mix for you of hard work, hustle, right place, right time, believing in yourself. Did you guys ever feel like maybe this, this is just not for us? Maybe it's not meant to be? Or did you always feel a lot like of times. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the thing was like, and, and I, like, I just, you know, my son, like I said, just graduated from Berkeley College of Music. He went out to LA with his band and I probably gave him the best advice, but the worst parenting advice, okay. which was, I told him not to have a backup plan. <laughs> you know, I was like, I want you to, if you want to do yeah. this, you have to go in all in. Like yeah. you have to not, you can't have half of your attention somewhere else, you know, hedging your bets. And so like Good I advice. did, I did every job possible that couldn't become a career. Right. Like I did everything in construction and everything at, at, you know, at restaurant jobs, everything, you know, driving delivery jobs, like uh, anything that I could do that if I had to quit a job on Friday, I could get a new one on Monday mm-hmm. if I had to have a gig. You know what I mean? Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah. Wait. So, and anything that also didn't take away my attention. Like okay. I knew that this is what I wanted to do. Like I, I don't even know if I have a good work ethic. I just know that I have a good work ethic when it comes to doing this. I'll work 16 hour days. You know, I'm gone nonstop because it's just something I love so much. Yeah. So that advice that you gave to your son, Mason, right? Is that he's 25? Mason, yeah. Yeah, uh, 25 years old. Is that the same advice you'd give to somebody looking for their big break? Like just don't have a backup plan? I mean, yeah, I think you kind of have to. In my opinion, this is not something, it's a life that you're kind of into. You know what I mean? And so it's not something that you can kind of be half in and half out of. I mean, I, I, obviously you can, there's a lot of people that just enjoy music. There's a lot of people that, that play music in their off time. There's a lot of people that, but you know, if you're, if you have that obsession and you really want Mm -hmm. to be a part of, you know, creating as, as for your, for your job, like I get asked all the time, what would I be doing if I didn't do this? And my answer is always just, I would be doing this for less people. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. You have to do this. You're not yeah. doing it for the audience. You're doing it because it's it's like what you were created, who you were created to be, right? This musical. Yeah, like these songs sit inside of my head. They take up space, like, you know, in my head and I have to get them out. Yep, yep. And then also there's other things that are going on in my life that for some reason, the I can't figure out a way to explain something to you. But if I... If I pair it with a melody and I put it into a song, mm-hmm. it explains it better than I ever could. And you know, the same reason why people love music, because your favorite song might ex- might say something to you about how you're feeling better than you can express yourself. Totally, totally. I, I, I completely get that. I have to ask you, did you, I heard that you opened up for a band called Jars of Clay. I was a huge yeah. fan. Is that, that's legit? You really did? First, uh, yeah, you know, when we started out, we never really opened but for the first tour, we were like the first year, yep. we were opening for a, a band called Jars of Clay, which, you know, yeah. they had that, that really big hit at the time. Uh-huh. Um, and then uh, a band called The Guffs. We opened for the Lemonheads. Uh-huh. Yep. And then we did one show opening for the Rolling Stones. Oh, my God. That's amazing. So, uh, Rob, you've been real open. I mean, you get your big break and you spiral out for a little bit. Rolling Stones at yeah. the time called you out. Like, how did you get out of that, that, that space where you started to spiral because of all the success? I mean, it, I'm not sure that it was because of the success. I think that it was just because of the freedom maybe that the success had given me. You know, like I was this kid that had never been anywhere. And so everywhere I went was the best place I'd ever been. And everyone I met was the most fabulous person I'd ever met. <laughs> You know, and I come from a, like a family with a history of a drinking problem. So you take all those things and you put them together. Um, I mean, these are still things I struggle with. These are things that me and my therapist talk about, you know, on a weekly or biweekly basis. Um, just trying to keep everything in check, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I think at that time I didn't. First off, like, you know, there was a stigma around asking for help about those kind of things. Mm-hmm. There was, you know, it was a time, I think, in the 90s where you kind of were rewarded for bad behavior you know, you were kind of rewarded for being a bit of a mess. It was kind of sexy. There was something bad romantic boy. about it. The bad boy. Yeah, exactly. And so like it was everything that you would, everyone around you that you would kind of turn to, nobody really saw it as like, yeah, you know, boys will be boys kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so it just, you know, it, I think it took a while. It was until I met Maddie, really. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was a bit of a mess, but then I think having something else in my life to care about other than you know, music, which is a very high stakes thing for me. But at the same time, I was only letting myself down anytime I did something, you know, I didn't have anybody else that I was responsible for. Yes. And I think, you know, having my son be born and then just after that meeting Madi, mm-hmm. uh, you know, these things made the stakes higher. Yep. 
And so it made me realize that, you know, that I, I had other things and I had someone that I wanted to be a role model for right. in my son. And I had someone that I wanted to be proud of me in my wife. Oh, that's awesome. You talk a lot about your wife, Mari. Marisol is her name. And I remember, you know, when I was in your home talking to you and your wife years ago for that uh, Nightline and ABC story. Mm -hmm. I mean, she has been through a lot. She's been through neurological Lyme disease, brain surgery. And you said something to me. You guys are going on 25 years of marriage. I love your relationship. But you said when it's bad, it's worth saving and when it's good, it's better than anybody's. How you've been so supportive. What's gotten through you through all of those rough spots, Rob? Um, I mean, it's it's hard to say. I mean, music has been a part of it. You know, my community here, my you know, my, the musicians that I travel with. I mean, we get each other through it. Mm -hmm. But then you know, there's at some point you there's a there's a point that you get into a situation where someone's dealing with something like that, and you can't do anything to make it better. And you realize that the person is coming to you not because they want you to fix it, mm -hmm. right? Like, they're, you know, they come to you and they tell you what's wrong. They just want your empathy and they want you to be there and they want someone to listen to yeah. what they have to say and someone that's, that's recognizing what they're going through and validating, you know, the way they feel. And so I think sometimes you just learn to kind of be there. Yeah, and exactly. it turns out to be like one of the, one of the, the best tools you have in your toolkit is just, you know, letting somebody know that you that you're around to kind of help them go through it. And then at the same time, I mean, she's such a strong person that she he's there helping me through everything I'm going through as well. Like she mm -hmm. finds that time as well. You got to make sure that when you're going through something like this, it takes up all of your time and all your attention just trying to keep your health together and keep things on track. And you still need to find time to take care of the relationship as well. And and to to, to just the relationship portion of of your of your union. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. And so we've been really conscious of that, of like, you know, we are there for each other. We're this team that gets each other through all these things that we're going through, but we're also a couple and we need to, you know, to treat each other like, you know, like we're mm -hmm. things holding on to each other. Yeah, you talked about wanting to be a good role model for your son, Mason, who recently turned 25 and you posted about him on Instagram. And <laughs> there was, there are a lot of comments. People were like, I didn't even know you had a kid. <laughs> and I know you, both you and Muddy are very private and Mason's from a previous relationship. Tell me some of the joys and challenges of being a dad, especially you, you have a 25 five year old, which is crazy because you're only you're only thirty two, Rob. So I don't I know. understand Look the at math. That. I mean Thank you. And thank you for that. I know. It was an anomaly. Nobody talked about. <laughs> um yeah, it's weird too because even, you know, other people in their fifties, like people my age I, I guess they got started a little later. And so like the, everybody I know has like, you know, maybe a ten year old, mm -hmm. you know. You know, I mean, and I wasn't that young. I was 27. Right. You know, which is, you know, ridiculous, especially if you're from the South. That's, that's I live old. in the South now. You have like three kids by now. Yeah, yeah, I know. When I came back home at 18, they're like, you're not married yet? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it was, it was, there was a lot there because I was gone a lot for my job, even more than I, you know, than I am now, because at that time you have less control over everything. You, you're just kind of riding it out. Um, and I, and, I, and I was a weekend dad, so I didn't have him all the time. He was, at one point, he lived all the way on the other side of the country, and that was a nightmare. Yeah. But then when he was like seven, he moved to Boston. And so then he was only three hours away from me. That's great. And yeah. so then I got to see him all the time. Like if I was home, I would, I'd, every weekend, you know, I was a weekend dad, I was fun dad. Then you, you, you don't want to try and overcompensate. You know, you still want to be a dad mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and not just, you know, I'll give you everything you want because I don't see you enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so like I struggled. The, the, the best thing was like I struggled of all the times that I didn't get to see him and everything that I missed. And the... Uh, I was talking to him just, you know, on this tour, he was on it for like a week or two on the tour. And he was just like, dad, I, I don't remember any of that. Really? You know, he's just, yeah. I just remember like, you've always been kind and you've always been supportive. You know, he's like, and I just remember, you know, you always being there anytime I needed you. And I was just like, oh, thank God. I mean, it's so, it's so crazy too. Like the, what we put out there too, our kids will pick up. Like we don't, yeah. like we, we feel all of this guilt about not being there for every single moment. And then you have to make up for it with gifts and lavish them. But like, we're not going to harm our kids if we have passions. <laughs> you know what I mean? If we're yeah. on the road for work too, but. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think if anything, you know, my son has seen what this means to me and that's why he's put his whole life into it. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I was, a, I wouldn't say suspect, but I was curious about how it was going to go and how serious he was going to take it. And, you know, going to Berkeley is, it was a big step, but mm -hmm. it's also a huge expense if it's not something that he wants to do. Yeah. And, uh, 
And watching him through those four years just really blossom. He spends all of his time rehearsing, all of his time just building and getting better and stronger and writing. And so, you know, I feel like this is this is something that I think he could be really, really good at. Yeah, did, you know? Have you given him some um, possible names for a band like Tabitha Secret or Bond right. Bondage? Say, son, I've got, yeah, I've got, I've got a long list. Lots of <laughs> I've given him lots of advice, and he's ignored all of it. And, and that, shows, that shows that he knows exactly what he's doing, except for the advice you gave him about not having a backup plan. He's like, I will listen to that. So, that yeah, I know that was an easy one for him to take. I know, seriously. I figured that without a backup plan, the worst case scenario is that I'm going to have a 30-year-old son living on my couch for a little bit. And, and that's a small price to pay for like helping him find his dreams. He can, he can join the dogs. Um, okay, we're going to go through. Also, you know, it's funny. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going back out with my solo band next year. I'm okay. starting, I'm putting, putting together a new solo record. And uh, I have a few like corporate gigs and one-offs and charity gigs and stuff coming up. Yep. Mason is actually going to be the guitar player in my band. Stop it. That's amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. What a proud moment. Will this be like really the first time the two of you have shared a stage together? No, he's whenever we're he's out with me, he always gets up and plays. Right. But it's usually a song or two. Right. And, and his band opened up for the Hollywood when we just did the Hollywood Bowl, his okay. band opened. Okay. Um Aww. but this will be like the first time, you know, that we've actually he's been in the band. Yeah, that's so awesome. That'll be a really great moment for the two of you. Let's go real quick, kind of like some lightning round viewer questions that love right okay. Uh Rich Espinosa wants to know who's your favorite artist? Slash band. Wow. I mean, for me, I mean, uh, all the songwriters, right? So Willie Nelson, you know, the Beatles, Elton John, Mm -hmm. uh, Billy Joel, Tom Petty. Okay. Got it. You know, I mean, just songwriters. Um, Manny M says, when are you making another album? I still listen to Push. Well, Manny, you just did make another album, right? It was just called Where the Light Goes. And and we've made so many since Push. I know. I know. Exactly. (laughs) It's like when people asked you after Smooth, you know, with uh, with Carlos Santana, they're like, are you going to make anything else? And you're like, dude, I've been making millions and downloading millions yeah, of I songs. Have, ask I haven't been home in years. <laughs> okay. This is a weird question. Uh, Steve says, coffee creamer, favorite flavor. I mean, th- sometimes they just have random I'm a, I'm a straight, I'm a coffee mate powdered original. Are you kidding me? No. Oh wow, that's kind of hardcore, actually. Um, I'm, you know, that's that's pretty. That's that's uh, that's some pretty you know <laughs> white trash southern stuff. Right I there, didn't huh? want to say it, but you said it for me. Um, Salma just says thank you for your musical talent. I love this question. Catherine says, "Can you give me your thoughts on the Barbie movie using Push?" And of course, you know, if if you haven't seen the Barbie movie, everybody, I know some people love it, some people hate it. I loved it. Ryan, I just saw it yesterday. What did you? Okay, so Ryan Gosling. Let me tell people. Like, let's tell people what Ryan Gosling is playing. He's covering like kind of a hilarious cover of Push after he and Barbie are on the rock. So, what did you think about his cover? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it's weird. On one hand, you you feel like you know, like Paul, I think said, you know, that you're the you're the soundtrack for the patriarchy, but then you know, but there, there was a lot of layers going on there, yeah, you know. Yeah. I thought, and and just watching his beautiful mouth sing my song made me really happy. Um, I thought he, I thought it was fabulous. What's really funny is I'm not allowed to promote Barbie because of the SAG after thing. Okay. So like during all the time when everything was going on, we can't say anything at all, Which is crazy. and we're just like. We, we got this thing going on. Oh, but it's pretty awesome. And, and it's not lost on all of us Matchbox 20 fans. So Yeah, that movie got heavy really quick. It got heavy real quick. But I enjoyed it. I thought it brought up some necessary conversations, you know, and like- I'm not promoting it, no, but I love it. No, you don't have to promote it. You, can, you have an opinion about, as a person, whether or not you can like it. But okay, Rob, I think that's really all I got for you. I mean, this has been great to catch. Oh, what's going on with the light? You losing power? No. <laughs> I had, for some reason, my TV just popped on. <laughs> Sorry. I was like, well, it's not like a party just kind of came into the room. <laughs> like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> Rob, where can people uh, keep in contact with you, find out what you're up to? Uh, well, you know, I mean, uh, Rob Thomas, uh, my Instagram music kind of lets everybody know what's going on mm-hmm. or anything with, you know, through through uh, robthomas.com or matchbox20.com to kind of find out what's happening. Uh but, you know, just keep your ear to the ground. You'll find me. I know. I, well, I just want to say I've got lots of respect for you, not just as a as a songwriter and a musician and an artist, but as a husband, the way that you have faithfully, you know, just the way that you have navigated all of the struggles with 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 Muddy's health. And the two of you are just an inspiration. You're a good dad, too. How awesome. See, I, I, I'll tell Muddy you said that because... No. <laughs> 
Oh, well, it's been great to, to connect with you again. And Addie wants to say goodbye. Addie, you want to say goodbye to bye, me? Addie. Any questions for Rob? Oh, oh, you want to say bye? Oh, now, now, now puppy perks up. What's, oh. what's his name? Ollie. Ollie. Oh, hi, Ollie. Hi, he's buddy. like, he's like, I see a cute dog. She's, she's a little young for you, Ollie, but you know, we'll see. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that conversation with Rob. Maybe if you want to reach out to him on social and say, hey, love the conversation, uh, give him a shout out. I want to be generous with our guests on this show. And speaking of guests, next week, you might know her from One Tree Hill or maybe from country music. I'm talking to Jana Kramer about her big break, giving herself another chance and the love that she didn't expect to find. That's all next week. Oh, one more thing. Is this still on? Yeah, it is. If you're watching on YouTube right now, hit that subscription button or wherever you're listening, make sure you subscribe so that you don't miss a beat and invite your friends. Let's spread the word and let's talk about it.